have you ever found yourself in a, a place in life where, where you, you've looked at something and, and you've, you, you've, you've made an opinion about that thing only to go back later and change your mind? I think we all have, right? Where we have perceived something that we have, our perspective been, has been a certain way, but then over time that perspective changes. I don't know about you, but I'm a big fan of illusion art. Anybody else know what I'm talking about when I say illusion art? Something that you look upon and your, your mind immediately makes a determination of what that thing is, only to have your mind redirect and change and see something different. I'm going to show you a couple famous ones. Tell me what you see. You guys seen this one before? What is the first thing you see when you look at this picture? Maybe an elderly man and, and his wife, right? An elderly man and an elderly woman. But look at it for a moment. Do you see what else is in that picture? You got a guy playing the guitar and a lady sitting next to him. Do you guys see it? How long did it take your mind to to catch that? Three or four seconds, right? How about this one? Is this guy looking straight at you or is he looking to the side? It's hard to tell, isn't it? What did your mind first go to? Straight? But then you quickly saw it, right? You saw he was looking to the side. How about this one? What do you see here? Is that a guy? Or is it a lady reading, holding a cup of coffee? Do you see it? See how quick your mind shifts? You you immediately see something first, and then after a few seconds, your mind redirects, and you begin to see inside. You begin to see what's really going on in that picture. I don't know if you guys have ever been out to, like, a chalk art festival. But if you do, you know that your perspective drives what you see. And so imagine you're walking down the sidewalk and you come across this. Immediately, what do you think is there? You think the sidewalk is caved in, right? And now here's some guy standing on a ladder trying not to fall in. Why do we think that? Because our perspective is used to seeing something like that in 3D. But the moment you get closer to it, the moment you look at it, the moment you touch it, you realize that that is literally chalk on art or on concrete, painted by an amazing artist. See, our perspectives are powerful. Your your perspective drives how you see the world, how you see yourself, how you see the people around you. And and your perspective leads to the way that you live your life. It leads to your actions. It leads to to the way you treat people. It leads to the way you respond in certain situations. And, And the reality is our perspective is constantly being formed and influenced. It's being influenced by the world around us. It's been influenced by our experiences. It's being influenced by the informed and shaped by the people we talk to, by the things that we listen to. And so one of the questions we always have to ask ourselves is, who and what is shaping our perspective? And is our perspective being shaped for good? Or are we missing the right perspective? For the last three weeks, we've been walking through the book of Jonah. And we've been seeing a a, a guy in Jonah who had the wrong perspective. Someone who truly missed what God wanted him to see. You know, if you've been following along with us in in the book of Jonah, it's a really interesting story. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet called to the northern kingdom of Israel. And God came to Jonah and said, Jonah, I have a special mission for you. I want you to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. And I want you to tell them they need to get their act together Otherwise, judgment's coming. And Jonah didn't like what God had to say. So Jonah decided he was going to go the opposite direction. So instead of going this way to Nineveh, he went the opposite way, hopped on a ship in Joppa, and decided to take that ship all the way to Tarshish, which was 2,500 miles in the other direction. But Jonah quickly realized that he couldn't outrun the call on his life of God. And so God sends a storm. If you remember the story, Jonah's in the boat sleeping underneath. And the storm comes and the sailors, who are pagan sailors, don't know, don't know God at all. They start to worry. They start to, to realize that something's not right. And they go wake Jonah up and they realize, this is your fault, Jonah. We are in this mess because of you. Jonah realizes the only way to save everybody's life is for Jonah to get thrown overboard. And so he gets, the sailors didn't want to toss him overboard, but Jonah says, look, this is the only way this is going to change. Jonah gets thrown in the sea, sinks in the sea, the storm storm stops. The sailors actually praise God and make a sacrifice to God, the Hebrew God of the Bible. And then we find Jonah floating in the water. But that wasn't the end for Jonah because God had a bigger plan. 
And so God appointed, we read at the end of chapter 1, a great fish to come swallow up Jonah. And for three days, Jonah is in the belly of this fish or this whale before he gets spit back out on land. And during that time, you see this moment of surrender for Jonah. When Jonah realizes, okay, God, I can't run from you anymore. I've got to give in. God, this isn't working. And so once God gets Jonah's attention, God spits Jonah back out on the dry land, and Jonah goes to Nineveh. And so last week we talked about Jonah and Nineveh. And so Jonah goes to Nineveh, and God says, Jonah, I'm going to give you a second chance. And we said, church, isn't it good that God is a God of second chances? How many know that God loves to give second chances and third chances and fifth chances and 45th chances? Amen? And so Jonah gets a second chance, and he goes to Nineveh, and he walks a day's journey into Nineveh, bleached out from fish gut juice, looking really scary. And he walks in, and he gives them the worst sermon of all time, 40 days, and God's coming for you. But something crazy happens. We see that the people of Nineveh hear the story. They see the, the guy that got eaten up by the fish, looking weird given this terrible sermon, and God moves in their hearts. And now we see the people in Nineveh repent. They, they put sackcloth and ashes. They, they even put sackcloth on their horses and their cows. We said that was the original dog sweater, right? And now we see that God relents against his judgment. Notice what happens in the, at the end of chapter 3, verse 10. Notice what happens. We, says, we see God saw what they did, God saw that they repented of their evil wickedness and their violence, and, he, and they turned, and what did God do? He said that God relented of the disaster, that he said what he was going to do, and he did not do it. Now, at this point in the story, you would think that Jonah would be pretty excited because God used Jonah to change the heart of a nation. We said last week that, that this has been said to be the biggest revival in all of the Bible. And God used Jonah for it, a prophet, but what we find is that Jonah wasn't happy about this. That Jonah was actually pretty mad because he didn't get what he wanted. And so we find this engagement here where Jonah is mad with, he's mad at God. And, and so they engage into this, this, this discussion where God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, why are you mad about this? And Jonah says, it's because what happened wasn't what I wanted to happen. And God said, that's because you have the wrong perspective. And so God uses, what we see in chapter 4 is that God is going to speak to Jonah and he's going to help Jonah see the right perspective. But sometimes we have to go through the, the valley to have our eyes open, to have our perspective changed. And this is where we find Jonah, at the bottom of the bottom in chapter 4. And God's going to speak to him and say, Jonah, let me help you grasp my perspective. See, the reality is I think all of us find ourselves in a story of Jonah and all of us come in here today with perspective, perspective for life, perspective for relationships, perspective for the situations that we're in. And I guess the question that we have to find out is, are we like Jonah where our perspective is skewed and we're missing God's perspective? Or who are we actually allowing to shape our perspective? And so this is what we see that God is speaking to Jonah here today. And he's, he's asking the question, Jonah, why are you mad? I need you to see things through my eyes. So this morning I've titled my message, Grasping God's Perspective, because I think there's some amazing truths in the midst of this account in Jonah chapter 4 that can change our lives and help change our perspectives to be able to see the people, the places, and the things around us from the eyes of God. So if you have your Bibles, let's look together. Jonah chapter 4, and we're going to read the entire chapter, Jonah 4, 1 through 11. But actually, let's start off in chapter 3, just at the very end, real quick. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Again, here's what happened. So when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Okay, Jonah 4. Let's see what, let's see what happens to Jonah here. Jonah 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Why was he angry? Because he wanted Nineveh to get destroyed. And here God has now relented and shown forgiveness to Nineveh. So now Jonah's mad, and he prays. Notice his prayer to God. He said this. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish? For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Notice how mad John is. He's so mad he wants to die because he didn't get what he wanted. And notice what God does here. So Jonah went out of the city and he sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade till he could see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But, verse 7, this is really interesting. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it, it withered. When, when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. Second time he said he wants to die. And he, he, Jonah's a little dramatic, if you guys haven't figured that out yet. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being at night and perished at night, in the night. And should not I pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right from their left, and also much cattle. Cliffhanger, mic drop, into the chapter. Forefront, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the book of Jonah and a very obscure ending, Lord, but you have so much for us in that cliffhanger. Father, I pray that you help us to see today in Jonah chapter 4 perspectives that we have that, that are formed by things outside of you, Lord, where you're calling us to, to, to look to you and to gain your perspective because your perspective is the right one. And so, Lord, I pray today as we look at Jonah and we laugh at Jonah and we, we kind of brush Jonah off, help us to see ourselves in the story of Jonah, that we all are here at some level or another. We all find ourselves in a story. Father, we continue our prayers for our, our little ones uh, and for our kids and for our youth, Lord, as they, as they are back in school this year and they're navigating the, the, uh, the difficulties of this world we're in. Uh, we pray for our teachers, Lord, and we just pray that you use them in a special way. Lord, we pray that you can use us, use Forefront as a, as a place that helps lead people to experience that new life that we have in Jesus. Father, I want to lift up those families here in our church that are walking through difficult times and, and, and uh, Lord, dealing with difficult situations. Lord, we pray for Gene Shirley. We pray for his health, Lord, as, um, Lord, he's uh, recovering from an injury. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you just bring him back to, to full strength and that he's able to be back on his feet doing the things that he enjoys very, very soon. Father, we uh, continue to pray for the situation going on across the ocean in Afghanistan. And we pray for uh, just the, the rescue efforts. We pray, Lord, for uh, the, the men and the women and the children who are caught in a really difficult place. Lord, we pray that you move in, in a special way. Lord, we pray right now that you change the heart of the Taliban and that you change their heart, Lord, and help them to see that, 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 their, error, that, that their error and how they've gone astray, Lord, and how what they're doing is ruining lives. And, Lord, I pray you change their heart and you start a revival just like you did in Nineveh with Jonah right now. We pray that. Lord, we pray for those that um, are facing the hurricane, Lord. We just pray that you help them make preparations, that you keep them safe, that this hurricane uh, turns quickly back into a tropical storm and blows out and nobody loses anything or gets injured. Lord, we continue to pray for the people in Haiti as they're putting their lives back together after, that, after the earthquake. Lord, there's so much going on in our world, but we're reminded, Lord, that you are still in control and that you're walking with us never more than an arm's reach away. And so, Father, we pray that you guide us today as we look at your word. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. And everybody who agreed said, amen. Amen. So Jonah chapter 4 is a really interesting chapter. We see Jonah's reaction, and God wants to use Jonah's reaction to teach him an object lesson. So what we really see here is that God is going to show Jonah three areas where his perspective gets in the way of God's. Notice, again, verse Chapter 3, verse 10. So God decides not to punish the Ninevites. God relents. And then we see in verse 1 of chapter 4 that Jonah is mad about it. That, that Jonah is angry. And, and what we see is that Jonah's perspective was off. And so the first area we see Jonah had the wrong perspective is this. That Jonah didn't realize that God's invitations often look like interruptions. That in our life, and this happens to each of us, that God's invitations often come in the form of interruptions. See, Jonah was mad because he felt like he was 
interrupted. God called Jonah to do something, and Jonah didn't want to do it because that wasn't part of Jonah's plan. But in the midst of that, God was actually inviting Jonah into something bigger, into God's story, a story that Jonah could never have been a part of on his own. Now, I would be willing to bet that all of us hate interruptions. Anybody here just love interruptions? You love when your kids come and start pulling at your leg or, you know, you're trying to make dinner and your four-year-old comes in and wants to change outfits for the fourth time in the last ten minutes, right? Or, or you finally sit down, you open your Bible and you get your cup of coffee ready and you get your Instagram post ready to go and then the dog starts barking at the door. It's frustrating, Right? You guys know I, I tend to like to tell stories, and so I, I love to tell stories at home, but sometimes Courtney beats me to it. And so if you guys have hung out with us sometimes, you know I, I got a really bad habit. Courtney will be telling a story, and it's a good story, and I just can't bite my tongue. And so what do I do? I have to jump in and interrupt her and interrupt her story. And you guys know that always ends well, right, when you interrupt your spouse. She'll be telling this great story. And I'm like, but wait, you forgot this detail. And Okay, go ahead and finish it. No, no, you finish it. No, you finish it. No, you finish it. You guys know how that goes? Interruptions are frustrating. And they lead us to a place where we can get really irritated. But also, interruptions can make you angry. I mean, let's be honest. It, it, those of you that have had in, major interruptions in your life know that, that can lead to a really tough place. Maybe you you feel like your career has been interrupted because of a mistake that somebody else made. Maybe it was a boss, maybe it was a coworker, but you ended up feeling the, the pain from it. Or, or maybe this pandemic hit and you felt like you had great momentum at work or in your family or you were saving up for a house and now the housing market's gone crazy. And now you feel interrupted. You're not able to, to follow your plan. Your story halted. And, and sometimes that's not just frustrating. Sometimes that just makes you mad. And it leads you to anger. And that's where we see Jonah. See, Jonah had a plan and Jonah had a story, but God interrupted it. Really, if you look at the entire story of the book of Jonah, it seems like an interruption, doesn't it, to Jonah? God comes to Jonah, hey, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh to preach to these people. And Jonah says, I don't want to do that. That's not part of my story. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to write my own story. God says, no, I'm going to bring you back to Nineveh, and I want you to speak. A, I'm going to give you a second opportunity. I want you to go speak to the Ninevites and tell them to turn from their evil ways. And Jonah does it, but then God relents, and Jonah says, no, I'm mad about that because I didn't want that to happen. I hated, Jonah hated Nineveh, and he wanted the Ninevites to be wiped out. Jonah's story continually gets interrupted, and it leads him to a place of frustration and it leads him to a place where he's mad. And notice, Jonah actually doesn't just go hide in a corner and sulk. He actually approaches God, and they engage in this discussion. Notice how it happens here in verse 2 through 4. So we see this. Jonah actually prays to God and says, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was, gonna go, when I was in my country? When, when he was back in Israel and God called him to Nineveh, he's like, Is this not what I said? I didn't want to go to Nineveh because I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Notice how ridiculous what Jonah says is. It's like if your little one starts yelling at you, Dad, you're always so nice. You always give me snacks. Why do you always take me to the park? It's just ridiculous. Jonah's like, God, I knew you were going to save these people. I knew you were going to love them. I knew you were going to give them whatever they needed. How dare you? It's pretty ridiculous, right? Jonah's perspective here. Again, his perspective is off balance. He just doesn't understand. And he says, therefore, God, since you are good and I didn't want you to be good, take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. And notice what God says. God says, is it good for you to be angry about this? Like, is this actually a good thing? Like, why are you mad? And see, Jonah was mad because he missed God's perspective. He had been interrupted and he didn't like it. So he complains to God, like, God, I knew you would do this. Sometimes my girls, I have to trick them to get them to go into the mountains, right? We're so, it's such a beautiful place, but they just want to stay home or play at a park. And I say, hey, let's go on a mountain walk, right? Let's drive up and let's go to a mountain park. And then we get out there. We play at the playground for a little bit. And I'm like, hey, let's go on a hike. And they say, I knew you would do this. I knew you were going to take me hiking. I could just tell. You had that look in your eye, right? Like, I'm just trying to do something good. Hiking's good. It's beautiful. It's healthy. You know, get outside and get some fresh air and some exercise. Dad, I knew you were up to something, right? 
That's kind of what Jonah's doing. It's ridiculous while he's, while he's yelling at, at God about this. And God's like, look, why are you angry? See, why was Jonah so mad? Well, Jonah was mad because God interrupted him. And God asked Jonah to do something that he didn't want to do. And God asked Jonah to go to some people he didn't want to go to. And God asked Jonah to say something he didn't want to say. And then God did something that Jonah didn't want God to do. And Jonah was mad. And he was angry. But the reason Jonah missed it is because Jonah's perspective was off. I like what Pastor Rich Wilkerson Jr. says. He says that, that when God invites you to be on his mission, it will always feel like an interruption. Because we have a story that we're writing that we want God to write for us, but yet God's got his story, and his story is bigger, and it's better, and it's more beautiful. And when God calls us into his story, it often looks and feels like an interruption for us. You know, just think of the pages of the Bible. The Bible is full of stories of interruption. You think of Moses. Moses is, is tending his flock. He's, he's ran from Egypt. He's hiding, and here we see a burning bush, and God interrupts his story and says, Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt so you can set my people free. And Moses starts stuttering, and he says, I'm not the one to go, and God says, I'm going to be with you. And God uses Moses in an amazing way. We see David, young David, barely, bar, you know, barely old enough to play on the JV basketball team. And David brings some Subway sandwiches to his brothers on the front line. And he sees this giant across the valley shouting. And he, God interrupts David's story. And God uses David to take down a giant. See, the Bible is full of interruptions. Think of Mary, just a teenager. When the Holy Spirit comes to Mary and says, hey, Mary, I know you got all these plans for your life. I know you're, you're engaged to Joseph. He's a really nice guy. But I just want you to know you are now going to carry and bring the Messiah into the world. Talk about an interruption to your future. You see, God's interruptions are often invitations into something that's more beautiful and more special because it's part of God's story. And so many of the best things in our lives start as interruptions. So right now, forefront, I want you to ask the question, where is God interrupting you? Like where in your life is God interrupting you that it's actually an invitation? That God may be interrupting you right now to, to change your schedule because he wants you to begin giving your time to him. God may be interrupting you and, and, and changing your outlook because he's put somebody in your life that he wants you to speak to. Like looking at those illusion art. God, you, you see somebody who lives across the street, but God's going to interrupt your story so you can see their need, that God has called you to do something special in their life. Where is God interrupting you right now? But he's actually inviting you into something bigger than yourself, that he's inviting you into his story. So God often brings interruptions into our life that look like invitations. But also what we see in the, in, in the story of Jonah is Jonah's perspective is off. Jonah doesn't realize that God's grace is for everybody. That God's grace is for everyone. I heard one pastor say it, God's grace is for every race. See, Jonah is mad that God rescued the Ninevites. And notice what he does. Look back here at verse 5. It says this. That Jonah went out of the city and sat at, to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he could see what would become of the city. So Jonah is mad, and he actually goes out of the city, and he sits down, and he starts watching the city, and he lets his anger start festering. You guys ever been in a place like that where maybe something good happens to somebody you don't really like, and it makes you mad? You know, you're at work, right, and you're the one that you feel like you work harder than everybody else, but it's the guy in the cubicle next to you or the girl in the office down the, down the hall. They get the promotion, and you start thinking, how did they get the promotion? I'm the one that works the hardest. What does that do? makes you mad. And you start to look from afar and, and hope that something bad's going to happen. Now, we're at church. Of course, none of us feel that way, right? People out there, they do those kind of things. Nobody in here. How many of you have seen something good happen to somebody you really didn't like, and then later, as you watch them, something bad happens to them, and it brings a little smile to your face? Let's not admit that, right? Let's not admit that. Of course, that doesn't happen in here. The reality is it's easy to get mad to get angry because we see something good happen to somebody that we don't think it should happen to. This is where Jonah is right now. This is where Jonah is. And Jonah is so mad about it. See, Jonah hoped that the repentance wasn't true. And so Jonah walks out of the city. He builds for himself a little booth. Now, remember, this is like, this is in Iraq, right? It, Mosul, Iraq is where Nineveh was. So Jonah is in the Iraqi heat. <laughs> and so he builds a little booth. 
and he's watching the city because he's going to wait to see them mess up so God can then wipe them out. But notice what happens. God has an object lesson for Jonah here. You know, you know I think something that happens to us, and this happened to Jonah, and I, and I don't know. I want you to ask, has it happened to you? See, sometimes I think we have a, a habit of weighing our sin. And we might look at our own life and we say, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than they are. You know, I, I'm not perfect. My, my, I make a lot of mistakes, but, man, that guy, that girl, that family, those people, that neighbor, they just, they're just a mess. They're just a mess. And, and, and really, they, they don't deserve God's grace. Bad things need to happen to them. And so sometimes we begin to put our, 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 our sin on, on a scale, and, and, and what happens is it ends up dividing us. Just think about this last year politically, what we saw. I mean, we saw division like we've never seen before. It's so easy for people to say, how can those people believe that? Those people, they don't deserve God's grace. We do this nationally. Think about it. as a nation. We look across the globe at other, at other nations and we think, man, Afghanistan, those people, the Taliban, those people, man, they're a mess. God just take care of it. That's what Jonah wanted to happen to Nineveh. See, we, we begin to weigh our sin and we begin to say, hey, this person's worse than I am or these people are, are much worse than we are. And, and so God, do something about that. And God says, Jonah, I am. I'm sending you to show them the grace of God because God's grace is for everybody. God's grace is bigger than politics and it's bigger than national allegiances. And God's grace is, can bridge everything. And so I've given you a message to share and a second chance to go and to share it. See, Jonah hated the Assyrians. He hated the Ninevites. He, he hated the entire people. But, but don't we know that, that basically racism is when you think that you're superior to somebody else? And Jonah thought that the Assyrians were not worthy of God's grace. So he's mad. He said their sin is too great. But forefront, here, here's the reality. It's not about how much sin we have in our life. It's about the effect of sin in our life. We can't weigh sin because any sin separates us from the grace of God. And that is why we needed Jesus here for us, to give his life for us, to make us right with God. So it's not about the amount of sin. It's about the effect of sin. And Jesus came to destroy sin and to save humanity. And people aren't going to hear that message unless we take it to them. Because that's what God's called us to do. I love what Leonard Ravenhill says. It's such a good quote. He says this. He said, Jesus did not come into the world to make bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men live. And that's the reality that God is trying to get us to see, that all of us, God has called all of us as his people. And God has called all of us to be on this mission together, that God's grace is for everyone. And the, the, the sooner we realize that none of us deserved grace, but like Paul says in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love towards us, that while we were sinners, Christ came and gave his life for us. When we realize that we did nothing to earn God's grace, but God's grace was given, it then propels us to show that same grace to everybody, to show that same grace to those that God has put in our lives and those on the other side of the world. You know, when Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, What's the greatest commandment? Remember what he said? He said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. But he says the second is like it. It's to love your neighbor as what? Yourself. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says these are the great two commandments. And since God has made us in his image, that we are all made in the Imago Dei, racism, prejudice, looking down on other people because they're different than us, it's actually a violation of the second commandment. Why? Because you're not loving your neighbor. See, God has called us into his story, and his story is so much bigger. And yes, it's hard when we deal with people we don't agree with, when we agree with people who think differently than we do, when we deal with people who live a different lifestyle than we do, when we deal with people who see the world differently than we do. It's hard, but God calls us to go beyond that. And the only way we can go beyond that is to see God's perspective. Paul says this in Romans 12, 2. He says this. He says that we need to not be conformed to the pattern of the world. He says, don't be, tran don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do we become transformed by the renewal 
But no, the renewal of our minds is in this book. Because God is telling us that we are no longer divided. We are now brought together as one. And so now we are called to be the church. And God's grace bridges everything. It bridges all of our differences. But the only way we're ever going to be that is if we see God's perspective. And so notice what jo- the God says to Jonah in verse 11. He says, Jonah, should I not have pity on Nineveh? Because they don't know. They don't know their right from their left. They don't know their head from their, you guys know the saying, Right? Should I not show pity? See, Jonah didn't get it. And God hopes that we can get it too. So God wants us to see that his invitation often looks like interruptions. But in the midst of that, he wants to show that his grace is for everybody. But notice third, the third perspective he wants Jonah to see here. And that's God's grace must take priority over our preference. And this is a hard one. God's grace has to take priority over our preference. Look back. Notice the object lesson that that uh, God gives to Jonah. Look back here at verse 6. So remember, Jonah's sitting in this booth, and he's overlooking the city, and he's waiting for something bad to happen, and he's mad because God rescued them. And so God does something interesting. He appoints a plant. So I don't know what kind of plant it was, but just imagine, probably some kind of a big plant because it casts shade. He appoints this plant uh, to, and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. And Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Notice, that's the first time Jonah's been happy in four chapters, right? So Jonah's now happy because he's got this plant over his head. But then dawn came the next day, and God appointed a worm. And that worm came up, and it ate the plant. And now the plant's gone, and then, remember, this is Iraqi son here. Jonah, his head, you know, I imagine Jonah and I have the same haircut. And so the sun is beating down on Jonah, and the wind is scorching hot. And now Jonah's so mad, he's not just mad because Nineveh got saved. He's mad because the plant's gone. And he calls out to God again and says, God, it's better for me to die than it is for me to actually live. See, Jonah was waiting there for God to punish the Ninevites, for them to mess up. And then God brings this plant and then takes it away. And he reveals that Jonah's perspectives are wrong because Jonah's perspectives are all about himself. Notice what God says to him in verse 9. He says, but do you do well to be angry for the plant? Jonah, why are you mad? You're mad again and you want to die again. And this time you're mad because the plant's gone. Like, do you see how silly this is? Like, you don't have any care for the Ninevites, yet you're mad that the plant is gonna be, was taken away. Why are you mad about that? Because it was his preference. It was his comfort that got taken away. He didn't care about the Ninevites. Jonah just cared about himself. And, and Jonah said, yeah, of course I'm okay to be mad. You t-. And, and God says this, you pity the plant for which you did not labor and you did not make it grow, which came into being at night and perished at night. You, you were mad about a plant that you did nothing for. You did nothing to earn that plant. You did nothing to grow that plant. And that plant was taken away, and now you're mad. Yet, should I not take pity on the Ninevites? See, God says, why are you mad? You're mad that something was taken away that you didn't deal for because it it shows that your perspective and your heart was all wrapped up in what you wanted and your comfort. But you need to see that my story is so much bigger than yours. See, God says to Jonah, your eyes are on the wrong thing. That, that your focus was on your preferences, and you miss what God was doing. See, see, the reality is we all have our preferences, right? Jonah liked being comfortable. We like being comfortable too. The problem is when we begin to put our preferences as a priority over God's grace for other people or God's grace in the lives of somebody else. See, it's okay that you have your preferences. You might like your coffee black. I like mine with nine sugars, right? We all, we all have our preferences. But if I go over to your house and you don't have any sugar, is it right for me to complain that you don't have any sugar? No. It's okay. God wired us to, to have our preferences, but that doesn't mean that it gives me the right to be angry about something I had nothing to do with. And that's what God's saying to Jonah. He's saying, Jonah, I'm the one who's in control here. You're living in my house, and I have a heart for the Ninevites. And you're missing the picture completely. See, the problem starts when we put our preferences in front of God's priorities. And so notice, God teaches Jonah by sending a whale and then sending a worm. He sent a plant and then he sent the worm, right? To show Jonah that his perspectives were off, that they were in the the wrong place. And I think what God wanted to show Jonah was, Jonah, you should not be sitting out on this city. You need to be in that city with those people. 
teaching them about me, discipling them, and doing community with them because you're the one I called to change that city's life. And instead, you're on the sidelines mad about a plant when you need to be in the city doing life with the people I've called you to do life with. And so God sent a worm to get his attention. And I would be willing to bet if we went around this room that God has been sending a worm into our lives to get our attention to. You know, this last 18 months has been really hard. And this last 18 months has impacted all of us in different ways. And some of us have, have seen the, the terrible extremes of this virus. And some of us have seen the remnant effects financially at work in relationships. But the reality is that God uses those things to get our attention. And so maybe these last 18 months in this pandemic, God has used those as a whale, as a big fish, to get your attention because you've been running from God. And God decided it was time for you to wake up and see that God had a plan for your life, that God had a calling on your life, and that God wants you to stop running from him but to run to him. But see, for some of us in this pandemic, these last 18 months, we've been like Jonah. We've been sitting in our little booth off to the side under the shade of a nice plant, comfortable, just watching what has happened. Maybe God is bringing a worm right now to eat your shade to help wake you up to see that we can't sit on the sidelines anymore, that God has called us to be a part of his story and not our story, and that God is bringing that worm into your life to help redirect and get your attention that your perspective has been on the wrong thing, that he's called your perspective to see his big picture, and that is that God's grace is for everybody and that you have a message to take and you have a life to impact. And that God has put somebody in your circle for you to share the truth of Jesus that will change their life. And then they'll go on to change the life of somebody else. So what's your worm? And where has God God brought the whale and the worm into your story? Forefront, I want to close with a a story as we wrap up our time together this morning. Back in 1904, a guy by the name of William Borden graduated from high school in Chicago. And William was a... um, was part of a wealthy family. He was an heir to the Borden fortune, and he was destined, he was planned to go to Yale. Well, what God decided, what his parents decided to do is, and God too, what, what was decided to do was that William was going to go travel the world before he went to Yale. And so William went to Asia, he went to Europe, he went to the Middle East, and while he was there, his heart broke. William's heart broke for the hurting people in the world. And he felt that God had put a call in his life to go and to, to, to teach Muslim people about Jesus. And so William came back to the States. He went to Yale, graduated, went to, went to seminary, got his degree, and decided it was time to go. He, he wrote a letter to his parents. He said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life as a missionary. And a lot of his friends said, what are you doing? You're wasting your life. But he knew he had so much more to give. And that God was calling William into his story, but it meant rewriting William's story. So William was going to go work in Asia, and he was going to go minister to, uh, to Muslim people. So he stopped in Egypt to learn the language, to learn Arabic, and he caught spinal meningitis, and at age 25, he passed away. And it sent shockwaves all around the world. Here was this man who had a fortune, who gave it all up so he could go tell the gospel preached the gospel. He he rewrote his story for God, and yet his story ended much too soon. After his funeral, his Bible was given to his parents. And, And as his dad and his mom were thumbing through the Bible, they found three things written down. William said, wrote this in the page of his Bible. He said, no reserve, no retreat, and no regret. He was going to give his life to God because he knew God called him to a bigger story, something that was bigger than than the fortune that he had waiting for him. But see, William's story didn't end there. Through the telling of William's story, thousands of men and women have went into the mission field to, to follow William's example, to go tell hurting people all over the globe about Jesus. See, God is calling us to something so big, we can't even get our mind wrapped around it. He's calling us into his story that is so much bigger and so much better and so much more beautiful than anything we could ever do on our own. 
And sometimes he uses a whale, and sometimes he uses a worm. But what he wants to do is to get our attention so that we can change our perspective to begin to see what God is doing. So, Forefront, as we, as we leave here today, here's my challenge for you. This week, I want you to, to look at, at your life, and I want you to ask that question, where is God interrupting me right now? God, where are you bringing new people into my life that you want me to show grace to? And God, where have I made my preferences a priority rather than your grace? Because when we recognize those things and we repent of those things and we give those things to God and we say, God, here I am, use me, God does something special in your life and in the lives of everybody you come across. So let's look this week. Where is God sending a whale? And where is God sending a worm? And how can God use me to change the world? Forefront, let's pray together.